So I think where I'd like to start is I saw like your passion, passion for charity work and developing your team really intertwine because you're, so you're, um, you're, you're developing these, these team members and also um, kind of being a mentor. And so I'd like to dig into that and let's see. Um, well, let's see. So you began managing and hiring really early on. I've listened to a podcast you were on and you said you had started managing and hiring at around 18, working as a Mason. And so you have a lot of experience in, in building teams. I mean, you've learned probably just buku lessons about you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, so tell me, can you dig in a little bit and speak on how you train your new hires, um, your methods to helping them step into their new role with success? Sure. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot of questions. Let me see if I oh, can. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And just for clarification, when I was a Mason, when I was 18, I was just a laborer. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. So it was actually starting at College Pro Painters okay. uh, when I was 19. But that that's I still, you know, okay. I'm a little <laughs> off. Apologize for the, the error there. No, no, no. That's okay. Um, so to go, to go back to the question, like, uh, what is a recipe for success and leadership that I learned from a young age. Is that the right question? Does yeah, that and, and definitely that in, in terms of, um, I guess that would be a good place to start that also in terms of training teams. Training teams, okay, cool. Um, I would say throughout my career, one thing I distinguished the difference was managing and leading. Mm -hmm. Management um, <clears throat> is, is like being extremely tight on schedules, outcomes, expectations you have of people, uh, fulfilling promises of pay, uh, support, kind of stuff like that. But leadership, I think, has a little bit of a different paradigm where there's some more softer skills, maybe, of like being an empathetic listener, being an active listener, um, really sitting with someone going shoulder to shoulder with someone in the trenches and really sitting there and being with them um, through their journey. And I think about, I think about like my, my daughters, mm -hmm. right? I, they'll tell you, like, I can't manage them. They're not, <laughs> they're not manageable. <laughs> or at least when I try, they just roll, I roll me and they're like, whatever. <laughs> right? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've been there? Yeah. Um, um, so, okay, so I, I can't manage them and I don't manage them, right? Uh, the best thing I think I can do is give them guidance and lead by example. Uh, one is like in my due diligence, whatever my morning routine is, I have a morning routine, right? And then if I lead by example, then they pick up on it because they, they pick up little trails of success or how I've accomplished some stuff and like, hmm, that's worked for him. So maybe that might work for me. That would probably be an, like an example of leading leading from the front. Another one is when somebody's going through a really tough time. As an operator, as a manager, we often want to fix it and fix it right away because it's wasting time. Mm -hmm. When a, as a leader, you can't always do that. And that's not really our position to fix it because then if we fix it all the time and fix every, all of their problems, what's going to happen when we're gone? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Right, right. Now we're not around. Now what do they do? So a leader in that example is really sitting with someone and, and giving them tools and um, giving them inspiration and insight and how to lead themselves out of, you know, tumultuous time. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who's coming up, I would say understand the difference between management and leadership. And when you supervise people or you're involved in someone's life, I think you have to wear both hats. Right. I think you have to wear both hats, but there's a time and a place for what leadership is and for what management is. Right. That's really, really in depth. So um, when in your industry, door to door, I can imagine that mindset is huge. And you just kind of touched on, you know, when a guy's having a hard time, you know, how to approach that um, be, just because of the direct contact, contact with customers and that, you know, we're human beings and sometimes you wake up on a day that you are feeling it and, or you may come across a, a customer who's not feeling you and walking away from that 
how, I mean, how do you train your teams to handle that and become resilient? Yeah. So first and foremost, when somebody else is throwing shade at you, mm-hmm. it's not really your issue. They're, they might be having a bad day and we all have bad days. And so the first thing I think about is we have to kind of protect a little bit of our own ego and our, and our self-worth because that can be fragile if we take on everybody else's garbage around us. And at the same respect, not be upset when somebody else is really having a bad day and takes it out on you because they may not know better. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to be the cream of the crop and we're going to rise to the top and we're going to be resilient, then that means we take on some of the burdens of the world. Yep. Right. And that's what makes us strong individuals is we're able to take on some of the burdens of the world, but not lash it back. Mm-hmm. Right. Not start a gunfight, um, take some of it on with compassion and then keep on our due diligence and what we're trying to achieve. Cause we got to feed our family or we got to make a living or we right and pick ourselves up and go again. But at the same time, you know, Hey, I respect your boundaries. I, I'll move on, whatever. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's funny, like just asking someone like, are you okay? Is, how's your day? Yeah. Right? yeah, that personal connection, I know it's important. I mean, you know, between just feel, it means the world between a boss and, and the employee to feel like they're seen. Um, right. So that being said, when, when a employee is going through, one of your employees or team members is going through a time where, because the, the goal is to get sales. The goal is to reach as many probably ears as possible, knock as many doors as possible, and also, you know, hit numbers. When those numbers are low, and how do you coach these yeah. individuals through it? Right. First thing I ask is, why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Are you doing it for me? Are you trying to make me happy? You did, don't worry about it. I'll mm-hmm. die someday. I won't be around, right? Are you doing it for you? Are you, are you out there and applying yourself and going through the pain because you see promise in who you want to be and you're willing to embrace hard work because who, who you think you could be on the other side is greater than who you are today? And if you're willing to do that, then I'll coach you through it. Like, let's work through some of the stuff. Mm-hmm. But don't do it for me. Don't do it for the company. Don't do it, you know, do it for you. So I think one of the first things that I learned in, in leadership and management is a lot of the why, you know, Simon Sinek talks about our why and everybody's seen the video. I mean, they're so, it's so true, but it's really hard to resonate, mm-hmm. right? Like, I don't know if I love roofing shingles. Yeah. I don't know if I love a solar panel, mm-hmm. right? Actually, I don't. It's just, it's a piece of hardware, right? Yeah. But I love empowerment, empowering people. I love educating people and giving them the choice of feeling empowered on the customer level, let's say for feeling empowered for energy independence. I love that piece and doing the research and giving them that tool. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody's on the doors, I love the part where they get to make the choice to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Are you making the choice of being comfortable being uncomfortable? Because if you can make the choice of be comfortable being uncomfortable right now. Think about the greater good of who you'll be on the other side. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular success stories that you could share as far as um, team members that you've you've mentored or uh, seen some extreme growth in in your time working with them? I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, in my, in my personal career, I've recruited, hired, and trained over 700 salespeople, um, mentored a lot. I still mentor a fair amount today. My ultimate goal is to reach individually 10,000 people, not, not, through, not through like an influencer status or a disconnection because they see me on something, but actually shoulder to shoulder, consultation, talking, being involved in someone's life. Or when I die, someone would go, hey, I remember Jeremiah. Like there was this one point in my life where he made a difference. So, so there's a fair amount that I still work with today, right? And there's a fair amount of that coming on. What I really like, every now and again, I'll get a phone call um, or I'll get a, a message on Facebook or something. Years, I think the last, I got one six months ago from an individual that I coached when he was 19 years old. 12 years ago 
and he mentioned me in a podcast and how he grew as such a, as a human being. And now he's a successful CEO of this company. And he, he gave a shout out to me of being a mentor in his life at a pivotal age. And I've gotten multiple messages that way years later. When, when somebody sends that kind of a message, right, and there's no strings attached, there's no nothing, actually we haven't even talked since then, it's for them to go out of their way to, to bring me into light. I'm like, dang, that feels really good, right? That feels really good. Um, so, so I guess maybe there's some self, I'm not trying to boost my own ego, but there's like this selfish uh, credits that I like. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, if I could touch 10,000 people, right. With no money attached, no recognition attached, I'm not looking for it, but have that kind of an impact. Right. I think I'll leave this or the better place than when I arrived. I think that's a guarantee for sure. I love your number 10,000. I, I have this vision that for you that it will, it will be at a zero added onto that, but I know, you know, <laughs> um, and, and I think it's so validating. It must be just to hit those calls. I know that's not your goal. I mean, your goal is to touch these lives, but just think about the effect that when you mentor these people and, and give them that feeling that somebody cared about them, they're going to pass it on to somebody else. And so that's yes. where the legacy comes in. It's so amazing. Um, I'm really just impressed by, I don't know. I feel like you've really woven, you haven't identified your purpose to me, but it's, it's starting to like comes to the per the surface through your story and how you, you express it with such clarity, but um, yeah, just, try, uh, try this when you're at the grocery store and you see somebody else behind you, right. With groceries, just buy their groceries. Hmm. Right. Not a big oh, amount. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. the best. I mean, it's never yeah. happened to me personally, but that, Oh, that's like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's this, I, I do. I've, I do, I've done it a fair amount of times, but I remember there's this one kid, right? And he was like probably 18 years old, um, but he had diapers. He had diapers, he had milk, stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, I was like, ring all of his stuff up too. And the kid looked at me, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of like, what? Yeah. I'm like, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Keep it up. You're doing a good job. So, you know, he was on an errand to do, pick up those, yeah. Right, right. And he was, you said he was, oh, okay. He wasn't. He, was a, he wasn't a child, but he was, he was young. He was young, right? Maybe a young parent, mm -hmm. you know, at 18. I didn't have kids at 18, right? I can only assume, but he had formula, he had baby diapers, he had and then groceries, he had some stuff. And I said, keep, keep up the good work. Right. Like, doing a good job. And every night, I think, like, if we could make a difference, you know, one iota like that a day or a week or something, right? It's going to make all the difference. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. I really, a little go thing goes a long way and you never know, you'll never know where it goes from the point where you leave that situation. But um, I, I would like to know, um, do you feel like your connection to charity, your commitment to pr uh, priority to involve charities and, and give and be of service affect yeah. your team on and, and how? <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, so I've been broke three times in my thirties, mm -hmm. <laughs> like flat broke, right? Divorce, bankruptcy, a business deal, bad, like nothing, nothing. So I've had to build myself back up. This is my fifth business that I started. And I told myself in the last time I was a broke, I was broke and I was alone and I was down and out. Right. I was, I was, I was 36 and, and. And I told myself that the next time I do it, I'm going to bring as many people as possible with me. Mm -hmm. I told myself I may go broke again, right? I, I feel like now at 36 or I'm almost 40 and I, and I like broke down. I remember it was my last business partner when he let me go. And I was, I was like, dude, how many times do I have to keep starting over? But then I went home and I thought about it and I go as many times as it takes. But this time when I do it, I'm going to bring as many people with me. And so that was a part of why, why I do what I do now in working with charities and encouraging my people to keep working with charities and intertwining it in our business. And then, and then you know, starting another company for helping people through addiction recovery and, and life coaching. And, you know, I don't, so, so why we do this, like, okay, if I have the ability, let's say one, I have some financial success, therefore it gives me some freedom and safety and security where I don't have to, you know, work 20 hours a day just to make my bills meet, I should be give, giving some of that time to those who are in need right now 
of some of my gifts that I think I have for the world. Mm-hmm. It's not a vacation. It's not time to do any less. It's time to up it more because I've been blessed with an opportunity. So now when I think about it, it's like, all right, why do I do business? Is it to get rich? Well, when I have money and I'm comfortable, then what? Am I just going to shell away into a cave or go get this yacht or mm-hmm. go buy these planes and, and vac- whatever? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Right. I could never do that. I want to keep giving and connecting. Right. So instead of waiting until the outcome's achieved, I figured while I'm doing the journey, because there may never come a day where the outcome's achieved, but while I'm doing the journey, there could be opportunities in every day. Right. I think that's, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, so even just, it sounds like to me, what you're saying is, you know, you, in the times that you, you had failed and you had to build yourself back up, uh, when you, when you turn to giving to charities, it, it's like, it, um, it helps you in that process. And now whenever you read, you go through hard times that you lean into that instead of feeling, you know, that, that, that overwhelming sense of what do I do? You know, how is this going to, how's this going to turn out? You know, you know, that you're making a difference in the world and, and that's. Yeah. And I tell you what, anybody who's, who's a business owner, you develop these skill sets, right. That you're innately good at. I'm probably good at public speaking and um, probably we'll do it like connection, whatever. Mm-hmm. Get, take your skill sets and go apply it without money, without recognition. Mm-hmm. And you'll actually further refine what your skill sets are. When nobody cares <laughs> about your skill sets and you cannot monetize it, you'll actually see how good you are. Yeah. And I would put that challenge to any business owner out there. Start, start figuring out how to, if you're a phenomenal coach, right? Or mm-hmm. man of, of a team, go coach a, a small child's team. <clears throat> yeah. If you're a, a brilliant marketer, go do fundraising for, you know, an event that really makes a huge impact. That's a, that's really great advice. Do you have any other tips for somebody who's kind of gone on a path like as you have and, and have been and tried different avenues of business? They've they've hit failures, they've built themselves back up, but um, are continuing to pivot. What tips would you give them to help them find their footing and and become better business businessmen? Yeah, find out what you're genetically made for. Mm-hmm. So do some personality tests, preference tests, Myers-Briggs, um, different wealth dynamics, stuff like that first. We all have a different genetic imprint. We have some skill sets that are beneficial in one arena, but maybe not in another. We're, we're hardwired differently. Figure some of that piece out. Um, second one, think in abundance. I know it's really, it's really tough when you don't have money. Like, you, you know, it's really tough to figure out how to help someone when you can't even figure out how to keep your lights on. And I get that piece. When I went through my divorce, um, you know, my girls were hurting and, and I was hurting. And, and I said, we're gonna go do Meals on Wheels. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. I, we're, even though we like, we want each other, we want, we're, we're hurting, we need the stuff, whatever. I'm like, there's other people out there that are actually hurting probably more than us or, or maybe more deserving of some of the attention and love we think we need right now. And, and I still do it today, every Friday, right? I still do it now, going on seven cool. years later. Um, but that's an example of where, like, when you think you, you need something, there's more of an abundance of applying your skill set, applying um, what you may be innately good at. Now, for somebody who's been trying business and business over and over again and failing, A, that's, that's part of the game. But B, if you keep failing in the same arena, doing the same things, you're probably in the wrong arena. <laughs> think about it. And I would look at partnerships down the road. I think that's important um, as you're really going to grow and create impact. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm probably rambling now. <clears throat> oh, that's good. I, I, I support rambling. Um, yeah. It sounds like it's, it's all about perspective, you know, and, um, and those were really good, tips, uh, good points of advice, by the way. Um, so I would like to know, um, you had mentioned mentorship and and how you feel connected to it. And I'm curious to know if you have had mentors growing up that really made an impact on your life and made it yourself passionate about it in turn. Yes. Well, with the caveat, I should be seeking out more mentors. 
Um, and I and I definitely had mentors in the past. I would probably say at College Pro Painters was probably my early from from 19 through 27, 28. Um, that was a big part of my life. So my direct supervisor, the president of the company, like they were inspiring people. Um, they were very skilled people and they poured a lot of time, attention and money into my skill development, mm -hmm. allowing me to get certified in different skill sets, working with people, putting in a ton of time, effort and energy. Um, mentorship, you know, I do, I read a lot, mm -hmm. so, you know, cycling through two books a month and listening to another book on audio and I pick up nuggets of, um, and what's interesting, so I pick up nuggets of what successful people do. And then now I realize I try to apply it in my life. Um, what's interesting though, is that as I get older, I almost humanize more of these inspiring people um, that I thought were on kind of unreachable in mm -hmm. the past, but the truth is they were just people too. And a lot of this starts coming out and then it puts, I look at myself now in a different paradigm, like, well, I'm just a person too, but maybe someday I could be great. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Is, so is there any piece of advice that you you've learned from these mentors or, or book mentors, which are, I think are just as much mentors. You're being mentored by the wisdom of somebody wrote in a book that um, you, you really accredit or take with you that you would like to pass along. Uh, that I am good enough. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's powerful. Yeah. I think a lot of my life I've just felt inadequate and that I wasn't good enough and it's worked me. It's allowed me to work so hard, but sometimes like, working so hard that it ends up disrupting my family, working so hard that it ends up imploding from the inside out because I keep trying to strive to be good enough. Mm -hmm. But this whole time I've been good enough. I just couldn't get it through in my own head. When, um, uh, sorry, actually go ahead. No, you're fine. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. No, are you okay? If you wanna, you're welcome to continue if you'd like. Would, yeah. I was just going to say in understanding one or accepting that I am good enough, it allowed me to be more compassionate. Mm -hmm. Compassion towards others allows for connection. When I'm not good enough, I'm always striving and working. And, and there's actually a big disconnect when trying to prove yourself around other people. It's not really what we're meant for. And it never really brought me happiness. No matter how many records I broke or successes I had, if I was disconnected from the people around me, doesn't doesn't really help anything it's very true <clears throat> when I hear you say you know th those feelings of unworthiness um and maybe not good enough I of course connect I'm human I think that almost everybody in the world does and I definitely see a correlation between another common thing which is imposter syndrome and yeah. I wondered I'd love to know what your experiences are with imposter syndrome if you have felt that way or experienced it and um Maybe your advice to somebody who's struggling in that area. So what is imposter syndrome? Imposter <laughs> What's syndrome that is where you feel like you are not qualified and it could follow, it could be in the instance like um, maybe you've gotten to, you're, you're now a CEO of a company, but you look around and you still feel like somebody's about to say, hey, you're not, what are you doing here? Like, what are you qualified to do? It's like, this thing you play in your head, it can be, it can be happening to anybody on any level, but I don't yeah. know if that makes. So, makes so I'd probably first start with, yeah, maybe I am an imposter, but whatever you might be too. And I then <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, we all I first, feel that way. It's, yeah, it's, first, go ahead. Yeah. I would first start with that statement because who cares? The second thing I think about, am I adding value? Mm -hmm. Am I adding value to you? Am I adding value to my community? Am I adding value to this individual? Start there. If I'm adding value, I don't give a shit what anybody else says about imposter or not imposter. Mm -hmm. Add value, add value every day, right? The imposters are probably the people who collect big paychecks and don't add value, period. That's an imposter. Like what are you parasitic then on the, on the whole system we're trying to improve on? 
But if you add value every day in one form or another, I don't know how you could ever be an imposter in anything. Mm -hmm. Now, the feeling of inadequacy, I, I mean, you're right, we all feel it. What I found that helps me is discipline towards hard work. For example, starting morning, you know, morning routines at 5 a.m., mm -hmm. reading every day, quick workouts, like uh, writing, journaling. I just started journaling again, writing letters to my daughters, right? I, I got this idea um, from a friend a while ago about if I were to die tomorrow, I want to write all these letters to my daughters that they would have in a journal and they could come back and see, right? Having that connection then allows me to go, this is, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I think if somebody feels like they're an imposter and they've risen to a point of power, um, well, two things I would ask, did you do it unjustly? Did you hurt people along the way? And if you did, you better go make amends. Mm -hmm. We've all probably hurt someone in one form or another, but you know, go, go apologize, go make amends. Two, are you a crook? Like, are you now going forward, doing things in a just way, right? Value added, keep doing that. That's really good. Um, yeah, I think, I think waiting for the other shoe to drop uh, would either be like if there's an internal value thing that they're they're not fulfilling or they're, they're corrupting or manipulating their surrounding environment, um, stop doing that. Um, if somebody else is going to get, you know, I don't know if this is imposter syndrome, but I always think about like competition in the marketplace. How do we be different? I know we're going to be different because we're going to be a boutique solar roofing company. Because I, I teach entrepreneurship and I lead leaders and I empower people to do things the right way. So it's not being the biggest, it's not capitalizing on every single penny that comes across our plate. It's actually empowering others for them to create life-changing opportunities. Because if I can do that for them, then they'll hopefully do it for someone else. That was a great answer. I was, <laughs> I had heard, I like, I just really like the way you went with it. Um, and I think that it will definitely, that advice will help a lot of people. Yeah, but the, sorry, and just to tie back to the imposter syndrome, somebody might be like, you're not a franchisor. You're not da da da, what do you know about it? And I'd be like, well, I, A, I recruited, hired and trained 700 salespeople before my career and I know people, right? So you probably can't tell me I'm an imposter on there because the resume checks out. But then B, my intentions, right, are not, are to lift and elevate, right? And so people, I don't, I don't, I actually, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm on an island of one, and I am an imposter. But I know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I'm doing it. I don't care. <laughs> I like that. It's like you're saying if you center to beat imposter syndrome, make sure that you feel like you're adding value and are pursuing something that you feel you know, aligns with your purpose and that you are adding, yeah, adding value. I think yeah. that's just like, should be like a no brainer, but you just felt like it was just like this very innovative idea. You just popped in my head. So I'm, I'm going to use that myself. Right. <laughs> there you go. See? We're adding value right now. There's no way we can be imposters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. So parent, okay, so I think something is really important for people, especially now because of, there's a, a breakdown between, there's a new paradigm about how much time people are spending at, at the office and home and sometimes it's blending with your line of work as well. I know that, you know, pursuing leads and all the other work that goes along with door knocking and maybe even the hours can infringe upon personal life. Right. And I feel like from your story, you've, you've, that I've heard you say in, in the podcast and in, in, in Sasha's podcast yesterday, so I, I was, had the pleasure of watching it, that you learned that there is a high importance of setting boundaries and making sure that family, there's, you know, ample time, like family really is important in, in number one. Yeah. Um, how do you help how do you support your team in this? And, yeah. and, and um, what guidance would you give to any 
entrepreneur or um, up and coming, you know, person in business to yeah. pursue this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, what we do internally is like, don't work Sundays, right? I just try, I, I might do some like planning and stuff like that, but I really don't work on Sundays because I just need that day for myself. Um, two, I have rituals where like I do, you know, Muay Thai, kickboxing, jujitsu with my oldest daughter three times a week. And then I coach soccer with my youngest daughter, uh, the other two, two nights a week. Like I'm literally, and that's just my nighttime from five to 9 PM every night. Right. So if somebody else in my company had the same expectations, my partner, when, when he's with his children, it's the same thing. Like we just shut it off. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think that's, I think that's really important. Somebody asked me, uh, a buddy of mine asked me his, his office administrator, um, had uh, death her son and her family, someone she was close to. And she went home to the funeral and he's like, he asked me, he's like, how much time should I give her off before I expect her back? Whatever. And I said, is she a good employee? Do you, do you value her? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. I said, give her the world. Give her as much time as she needs, right? When you value someone, they'll take that value and they'll give it back tenfold. They'll respect it. They won't abuse it. So, so give them the world. Um, and so when I think about that with my employees and people I work with, I go like, your family's first because my family's first, right? About, well, my God's first, my family's first, second. Mm -hmm. But uh, over work. So if something happens to family, that takes precedent over everything else. And that should be understood. Um, somebody working their fingers to the bone and neglecting the family, they're never going to be a whole individual. And that's not what we promote here, right? Because that's not a healthy, that's not, health, that's not a person who's going to impact the world. That's a person who might impact your bottom line. That's not a person who's going to impact the world. We want to develop people who will impact the world. We want to impact people who will, you know, meet the barista at Starbucks. And, and now after that conversation, he or she's going to have a really good day, mm -hmm. right? Do that charity event or work with these people in the community without money, without recognition. And after you being in their life for a certain moment of time, they're going to have a really good day. Love that. Um, so <clears throat> speaking of family and parenting, I wondered if you've seen, okay, you've experienced any parallels, um, between, um, uh, training teams and parenting or lessons that you've learned in parenting that you've been able to take into training teams or vice versa. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Always. Yeah. It's funny. So, so I'll start with the opposite. I used to bring my daughters out knocking doors when they were nine and 11, I think nine and 11, 10 and eight, something like that. And I would videotape them. And I even had one customer who like <laughs> made this mad post on Facebook and was going to call child services. And, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> like whatever. That's right. True. Because as, yeah, as a single father and a business owner, right. I only get a certain amount of time with them. So it's, it was like 50, 50 every other week, whatever. But the time I have is like, I'm not getting a babysitter. That was a rule I said, I'm not getting a babysitter. I don't care. I'm like everything I do, they're coming with me and they're hanging out and they're going to learn. And it was awesome. So on the parenting side, I don't treat my kids as I, I told a long time ago. Um, I can't remember. Uh, I think it was Ava, my oldest. Um, uh, uh, Okay, so I'm going to tell you something here. So when we went through divorce, she, there was unanswered questions that a child has. And she said, either, either you did something really bad, dad, or your mom's a bad woman, or mom's a bad woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, <laughs> she, she's a good woman. And I don't believe you think I'm a bad man. And I said, you know, sometimes things just don't work out. But here's what's really important is her and I came together in this serendipitous moment. And we had you. And I'm like, we, we, listen, we had you. And guess what? Um, God's got a really special plan for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was probably eight or nine at the time. And she looked up and she's like, what is it? And I'm like, I have no fucking idea. Cause I'm not God. But I said, it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be really special. And so I took that note ever since then. It's like, someday I'll go and I'll be gone, but they're children of God. 
And so my job as a parent is to not shelter them from the harsh realities that's, a, that's in the world, but it's maybe to give them some advice and give them what I've learned and help encourage them through what's coming down the plate, which is life, right? So I treat them the same when we're out working and I hold expectations and, hey, how many doors we knock and blah, 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 and I give them $50 and I hold them very sense, but they're making their own money. Now, fast forward, the cool thing is my oldest, when she was 14, as soon as she turned 14, she called me. She's like, dad, I got a job. I'm like, how do you get a job? You're not even old enough. She's like, I'm, I'm old enough. Colorado said blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> She's old enough. She co-called 40 restaurants on one of Colorado's busiest streets, Evans, until somebody hired her on the spot. Oh my gosh. She taught her well. Right? <laughs> and, I didn't, and I didn't even program. I didn't even tell her to do it. I didn't program it. I didn't even know she could work. But but she took what we, what I taught her like three years prior, applied it toward what she wanted and she went out and got what she wanted. Wow. So, um, so for parenting, I think not, not being so consumed and, you know, there was helicopter parenting. There's, we want to save them from pain and we want to now, because how can you enjoy the joy if you don't feel the pain? They just have to, and whatever happens, that's that's the grand design, right? Whatever happens is out there. Now I'm going to do certain things in my ability to advise against safety measures, but at the end of the day, like I trust their decisions and I trust how they do it. Um, with my, I guess, I guess you know, even with my employees, I probably say a lot of the same stuff. Like I'll get in the field and I'll coach, but if somebody's hurting and they're and they're not hitting sales or they're or they're, you know, they're really struggling because we do commission sales, right? So mm -hmm. they really struggle. They're not, I go, I go, this is your story. Drink it up. You're meant to be here, right? Because if you, when I, when I train people in, in sales, I go, one of the worst things that can happen is you book your first job because then you think you're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not, we're <laughs> not, not, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you have to keep that tension and that fight and that struggle. But when they're really going through a bad time, I don't try and protect them and guard them from the reality of what it is. I go, this is your story, right? Embrace it. Mm -hmm. Cause you're going to share this with somebody else about how you triumphed and you succeeded. How much would it suck if you never had a story? You were just good at everything. That's not reality. How interesting is that? Yeah, you don't want to be good at everything. You want to have a, a dynamic story. And you're right, like the, the lessons, well, I mean, I can imagine what they're going through just to remind them that it's not just face value. Like these challenges like are going to grow you and stretch you in all these different ways. Um, and yeah, like just like your kids, how they came into your life as part of God's plan. You know, these individuals that come to pursue and find your company specifically, you know, it's all connected. And so it's really beautiful. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I am curious because you mentioned about how long it takes to get good at door to door <laughs> and the sales. Um, I just wonder like what, what, um, um, what was I going to say? Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, what, when you have a, okay, I'm sure you have different types of backgrounds coming to you to, to find positions in your company, maybe people right. who have never done a single door-to-door -door sale in their life. And then the people who maybe this has been their lifetime occupation or vocation, and they're just looking to switch companies. I wondered, um, how you okay, approach training with each of these types, uh, maybe, in, um, and also if you feel like one type or the other tends to take, I don't know, have greater success within your company? So, yes. So mm -hmm. A, I'll put a caveat. Mm -hmm. I think anybody can do what we do. Mm -hmm. There's no archetype or whatever. Um, uh, extroverts typically can go a little further because they just get energized when talking to people. Um, if you're okay with rejection, and your ego can handle it. You, you can do whatever you want. Like be okay with that, right? Um, that I would say that speaks to our resilience piece and maintaining resilience. 
you have to be able so in in what we do because people judge you in the first five seconds maybe 15 i don't know so you have to be able to really articulate what it is you're trying to establish or get across pretty quick i would say um, don't use, you know, a ton of filler words. Don't use a bunch of backstory and don't try and manipulate the situation. You really got to believe what you're offering is of value to the person you're trying to offer it to. Otherwise don't offer it. <laughs> like don't offer it. Solar's not going to work out for every house. When I see massive trees all around or whatever, I'm like, I'm not going to sell them anything. Why? It'd be an injustice. It'd be a disservice to them and the, and the corporate and the, and the industry probably, right? Um, so I think really understanding your value proposition that you have to offer and driving it home in 30 seconds means everything, right? We do roofing and we do solar and we're a boutique company. So we can use multiple pro products. We warrant the whole situation of roof and solar. So you don't have to work with multiple companies. Like there's all these value, right? And that's what I really work with my individual people on their way of doing it. Some might be short communication. Some might be, I have one who's a writer and it's like very long. I have to tell them, no, less details. No, they don't need to know all that. <laughs> like, I get that. You understand. Yeah, you get it. Um, <laughs> So, so take our value that makes us different than every other company out there. And then I try to apply it to their individual preference and their style of who they are, because we all have a unique thumbprint. And if I can get them to understand our value, that makes us different in the market. And then they can apply it to how they are as an individual, then that's where we see success. Right. But if I try and take our value and I try and do a broad stroke that everybody should sell the same way, it should all be the same, this the same da da da, and, and I'm missing the individuality that makes them strong, it's, it's only going to go so far. Mm. So it's kind of customized to each personality. You can tell probably within a few hours of knowing them, or maybe a few weeks of training with them, what, where, what's going to motivate them. And um, that's really smart. Okay. Yeah. If you think about it, like our fifth core value is empowerment. Empowerment is understanding someone, meeting them where they're at, and then being able to take what we have and put it on their railroad tracks. So they're empowered to use our tools and what we have their way, how they want to, right? And we do it all on a justified way, no manipulation, no price gouging, no, no smoke and mirrors kind of stuff, right? right. But very least driven. Um, uh, well, first I want to check. I, I know I stated it from 1245. Um, are you in a crunch? Right no. Now? Okay. I no, uh, definitely, awesome. I didn't want to, I just want to make sure because I, I want to respect your time. Um, but uh, well, first off, I was, would you quickly, uh, you said the fifth core value. So that means there are four other ones. What are we just, I don't know. I'm sure. Is it on your website, but would you state those? Sure. Really yeah. It's grace. Okay. Grace. Grace. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. And really it's about showing relationships and grace. Um, so the G is gratitude. Okay. You know, every morning when I wake up, I'll say my prayers and I'll just be thankful for what I have, no matter how bad things are. Pretty thankful of my girls, pretty thankful of my health, pretty thankful, of my God, pretty thankful, right? Gratitude. And then also too, you know, it goes a long ways when you just tell someone, I really appreciate you. Like, I appreciate this. I appreciate what we have and gratitude and having that be your mantra throughout the day. The tough things that happen and come across your plate, which will, they are just a little bit easier when you show gratitude towards everything. Um, second one is resilience. You know, you, you probably heard my story. And, and like I said, in the, the ability of bouncing back, I, I've kind of realized now the last time, like, this is what I meant for. Mm -hmm. I wasn't meant for an easy path right? I wasn't meant for everything to go my way because if everything went my way, how could I ever tell my story? So resilience, when we all, when we make the choice to always bounce back, no matter what. And I tell you what, like one of the turning points was when I had children, there was no giving up. There was no, you know, I, I would cry a little bit or have a little pity party for myself, but I, I got these people who are counting on me. Right. So it's time it's show up, make a difference, but being resilient. Um, 
and and when it's funny when you mix resilience and and gratitude together when other people screw up to you you're you can be really nice and it's really easy and when you're really nice when they think you're really mad you should be really mad they'll now try and go huh that was kind of cool that was a I feel good, <laughs> even though I totally screwed him or screwed up, right? So those two kind of go hand in hand. The A is accountability, right? Draw a line in the sand and stand for something. When you draw a line in the sand, be accountable. I don't care. I don't care if it takes you 20 hours through the day, burning the midnight oil, whatever, like whatever. You know, there's this mantra or this thing like, oh, I got to work work well if you're purpose driven and you're and you like what you do and you, that adds value and you feel fulfilled does it really work mm -hmm. like whatever <laughs> i don't you know um but be be accountable to the promises you make that's promises to people that's promises to institutions the promises to yourself and just stop giving you know every morning we wake up we have the warrior we have the whip uh, and probably every through multiple decisions. So which one do you choose? And start flexing that muscle to choose the warrior time and time again, the hard work, embrace it, be comfortable, be uncomfortable, but be accountable, right? Because nobody likes the person who makes all these promises and never shows up. After a while, you just stop inviting them to the party. Forget it. Why? They'll say they're going to show and they just don't show. The, the, the last two kind of go hand in hand and it's connection right? And empowerment. So when, you know, connection is, you know, just like we're connecting right now, you're hearing my story and I'm understanding you. And I just left a homeowner's house and I was understanding their story and they're hearing my story. And when we share our stories, like there's this deeper sense of connection of, um, we get to kind of human humanize these relationships instead of me selling them something and them, them being afraid of, you know, is he going to take advantage, whatever. We can humanize a lot of this stuff and just be honest and open. It, it's good for some people, but the deal may not be good for others. That's okay. We can still connect, right? My Some employees may just not work out and that's okay because that's not, obviously I don't have 700 employees right now. So, so obviously it doesn't work out for some, but I still keep in contact a lot because we're still connected. Right. And it's not about what I can monetize or my benefit, or it's not about what they got out of it, their benefit. It's about us actually being better caliber people because we know each other and staying that connectedness and that cohesiveness of community will actually drive um, the benefit of what we're trying to do. So connection, same connection. And the last one's empowerment. You know, one of the worst things that we can do is probably hold people underneath their thumb, get leverage on people. Um, take advantage, manipulate, coerce, right? No, that's horrible. That's, I mean, uh, I empower, you know, I remember, I remember, and I'll go back to parenting. I don't know why I use so many parenting parallels, but um, <laughs> I remember like getting mad at my daughters uh, because, you know, we're late for school now because they can't find shoes, right? <laughs> I don't know if you've dealt with this. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> but I apologize to them. And this is started at a very young age. I'm like, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. You can go to school without shoes. I don't care. But I shouldn't have blown up. And, and I shouldn't have done that. And, and when I started doing that at a very young age, I empowered them to, to speak their opinion, right? To, to not feel like I'm the dictator of the situation, but that they're equal partners in this situation. And sometimes dad is maybe stressed out about something else and sometimes he had unjust anger that came out and they can hold me accountable to that because i've empowered them letting them know i'm just a human too and i'm really sorry and i value them and they weren't deserving of the way i just acted mm -hmm. so do you forgive me but empowering them i think that's that last bit you said about that holding people accountable is what they say. And then, you know, and that ability to be forgiving is uh, something that the whole world could use. And um, <laughs> um, right. so this has been amazing. I, I feel like we've got such good uh, content for an article. Is it's, it's, I mean, there's a million different ways we could go with this. Um, yeah. I did want to end with one question and I just wanted to like hear it from your mouth and just to make sure everything is aligned with with you know how you want so the question is 
with these articles, it's a really powerful way to connect with the world. I mean, with the Forbes, with the ones from my media, how do you, what do you want the world to know about you, Jeremiah, like from these articles? You know, what, mm -hmm. in, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, just a few, in a, in a few sentences. Hmm. Sure. <laughs> so Whopper. Wow. It's a big question, right? <laughs> uh, uh, we're all just, a, yeah. So I'm just a man just trying to figure it out. I'd say first and foremost that. I used to always have this thing, like we're all just a squirrel trying to find a nut. Yeah. Like we're all, we're all just trying to figure this out. So I don't have it all figured out for sure. What I've learned along the way is, you know, um, uh, discipline equals freedom. I think Jack O'Willenick said it, discipline equals freedom. Like the harder I work towards something, being a better father, being a, a good business owner, being a steward of my community and giving, and the harder I apply myself right in these areas, then I have a higher self-worth. I have a higher self-worth of being good enough. If I never applied myself in any areas, then I have a low self-worth because I'm not putting myself out there to try to be applicable. So I think anyone, no matter where they're at, if you put yourself out there and put in effort, you'll have this internal bar that just keeps raising, right? Of being good enough. Um, um, you should send me your energy bill so I can give you a free solar estimate. I want the world to know that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> just yeah. No, that's great. I mean, this is exactly what I was asking for. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, um, I think everyone has the potential. So one of my favorite poems is by Marianne Williamson and it's like our deepest fear mm -hmm. and Google it, Nelson Mandela read it, right? And I've, I would read it to my managers, my daughters, my people, but I have, I have this picture at my, at my place um, where it's my two daughters when they were young, looking at each other in the lake and there's a sun in the background. And it says, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. Ooh, that's beautiful. <laughs> and, I, and I would leave with that. As you let your own light shine, you unconsciously give people permission to do the same who are around you. And that's really important. What a way to end. This is, that is, a, I'm going to look this a poem up immediately. I've read Marianne Williamson, but I had forgotten about this poem. So that's, that's beautiful. Uh, well, Jeremiah, thank you so much for spending this hour with me. I really value your time um, and appreciate you sharing so openly and honestly and vulnerably uh, about your life and business. Um, and I hope I get the chance to speak with you again. And I look, for, I hope I get the chance to participate in writing one of your articles. Um, we will be in touch soon with updates regarding Forbes and that's all I have for you today. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. All right. I'll all talk right. to you. Bye. Bye.